All right, today we're going to talk about refraction of waves. Refraction can happen to uh, both sound and light waves, but we are gonna be focusing on light in this particular chapter. When we talk about refraction, it's really important that we understand that we are having a wave that's gonna pass from one material into another. This is key to identifying any examples, definitions. If we're looking at a picture and we're trying to recognize what exactly is this illustration supposed to represent for me, if we have two different materials, if we have the light going from material one into material two, that's gonna be the first thing that we're looking for to help us recognize or identify refraction. The second thing we're looking for is a change in the pattern or the path of that wave. So most of the pictures that we're gonna see today where it is drawing for us, here is a beam of light and here's how that light is traveling. We're gonna see that the path of the light is going to change. Now the definition says that whenever it passes into a material of a different density, the speed of the wave changes and it's the changing speed that causes the path to be different. So is it going to speed up in material two or is it going to slow down in material two? Um, it has to do one of those two choices if it's going to experience a change in speed. So we're looking to see that the light passed from one material into another and we're looking to see that the speed changed and we'll be able to visually see that because the path that the light was traveling will then be altered. I have a few illustrations here for us to look at. Notice that the definition has some of the words highlighted in a different color font. And so again, I just want to help you understand if you have a question where you are trying to recognize a definition for refraction, or if you are looking at a picture and you're trying to analyze what exactly is this an illustration of. The key things that we're looking for is that our light is gonna pass into a different material and we will assume that that different material is also going to have a different density. So air and water have different densities. Glass and air have different densities. So, um, you know, even if we're not talking about a light wave, if we're talking about something maybe more relatable for us. So if you're walking on the concrete versus in sand versus in the pool, right? Those are gonna be different materials or mediums that we are trying to physically pass through and they're made differently. And so um, the density of those materials and how easily we can move through those different spaces is gonna be different depending on what it is that we're walking through, right? So that's the idea here. Different materials bring different densities. Again, that density difference is going to cause the speed at which the light is traveling to change. So. Let's look at the picture of the guy in the water over here. If we are following the path of the light coming from the fish. So when it says real, this is the actual physical fish and the fish is in the water. And so if we were to see the light coming off the fish, please understand there's light that comes off in every direction. So some pictures you'll see light going all the way around for instructional purposes, most of the pictures are just going to draw the one beam of light that they want us to focus on. So the path that the light is coming off of the fish is actually this path right here. This is the path that the light is physically traveling as it leaves the fish. Now you can see that we have a red dotted line that is going to represent where the person believes the fish is located. So let's just focus on that path for a moment. So according to what the person sees, this is the path that the light is traveling. And you can see that's definitely a different pathway. So what happened to cause the actual path that the light was moving to be different from the path that the boy is seeing? Well, what happened is that it changed mediums. The light was moving in the water. Then the light was moving through the air. And so since the light is switching to a different medium, the speed at which the light was traveling 
is now different. And so what that does is it alters the path that the light is following. So if the light had stayed in the water, it would follow the orange line that I have drawn for you. Since the light entered the air, the light changed its path because it changed its speed. In this case, it began moving faster when it entered the air, and so it moved along the red line path. So when the boy is looking at the fish in the water, he believes that the light originated from the red line. And so if you have ever been in the water and um, maybe you were in the pool and there's a toy or something down by your foot at the bottom of the pool and your head is sticking up, have you ever tried to just reach down and grab that toy and you're like, oh, well, I thought it was right here, but it's not where you're feeling. It's not where you thought it was. Well, this is why. Because the light coming from the air or passing through the air is on a different path than the actual beam of light, which is originating from the water. So that's the idea here. So we are going to enter a new material. So here was water. Here, it's in the air, so there's our two materials. And this movement of the path is how we understand that the speed of the light changed. And so we'll get some specifics as to how we're supposed to know which way that um, light is gonna bend or how that path is gonna alter here in just a moment. But clearly, it changed direction. The path was altered um, because it changed speed. Here we have a picture of a pencil. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, the pencil is not offline. This is not a broken pencil. Um, the bottom half of the pencil here, it looks fatter than the top half of the pencil. And then um, we see that the pencil is seemingly over to the left, whereas above the water, it is appearing to be to the right. So all of this right here, this is just because of refraction. This is not a magic trick. Um, this is not a special pencil, a pencil. This is just a pencil that got put in water. And because the light is passing through the water, through the glass, through the air, we see a variety of um, images because of how the light is changing its direction, just like what happened to the boy over here. Okay, so here are some specific um, kind of cool effects that we get to see because of refraction. So this first one is called dispersion, and you do not need to know this vocabulary word specifically, but I would like for you to um, at least have an idea of what it is. And this is how we get to see the different colors of the rainbow when we are looking at white light. Now, if you would like to see a video of um, maybe a more elaborate explanation, you can definitely go to the video page um, on my website and I have a variety of videos linked in and one of them is talking specifically about how light shining through a prism is going to allow us to see the different colors of the rainbow. This is um, basically going to require us to understand that we have white light which is composed of all colors put together and again that's a whole nother lesson that we'll talk about at a different time but um, when the light passes from the air into this glass prism, it's changing materials, so the speed is changing. Um, what we will eventually come to understand is that the different colors of light all have slightly different wavelengths and frequencies. And so because they individually are actually different waves, um, they're going to be affected slightly differently based on their color. And so that's why they end up spanning out so that we can see the different colors of the rainbow. But this is technically refraction. It's called dispersion because it's the separating out of the colors, but it really is ultimately happening because the light is passing into a different density material. Rainbows are because of refraction. Um, it's the same idea, it's that dispersion effect where we have 
all of the different colors coming from the sunlight. Um, they're all merged together, so we just see the light, but then when the light passes into these air molecules that have um, different densities because of the extra moisture in the air, what we end up seeing is that refraction takes place and the light is going to get spread out into its different colors. Now, this one is really cool. Um, again, this video is also linked on my site, but um, this is a video about invisibility. If you've ever seen any of the Predator movies, uh, they're all about being able to quote unquote disappear, and they actually reference that in the video a little bit, but it's that same idea. We have something, we put it in the glass, and then all of a sudden the object seems to just kind of disappear. How does that happen? And so it ends up that it is refraction. Again, not a magic trick, it's just science, it is refraction. Um, but I thought that was a cool example I just wanted to share with you. So then, this right here is a vocabulary word. Uh, this next example, and I need you to understand that this is an example of refraction with an R, okay? Please get that right for future questions. So we're looking at an image here of um, a car driving on a road. Let me give you the setting. We are um, summertime, so it's really hot. It is, um, let's say, August in Texas. It could be August in Arizona, really, um, but we're going to call it August in Texas. There's no water on the road. There is no moisture. If you've ever been in Texas for a summer, it gets really hot here, and it's really dry. There's very little rain. So now that we understand the setting, there's blue light that seems to be coming from the ground. Now that we understand the situation, we understand that this is not water on the ground, right? But if you didn't know the story, if I had not set the setting for you, um, you might have seen this picture and immediately assumed that this was water coming from the ground. This is not water. Do you see that sky is blue? And it's the same blue that we're seeing coming from the road. This is refraction. The light is shining down onto the road. It's hitting these air molecules, superheated air molecules right here at the surface of the road. And so as the light enters, it is being refracted, bent so much that it now is coming up at our eyes. And so when we talk about a mirage, this is what I want you to think of. So here is your definition. A mirage can be identified as an optical illusion, but I want you to understand that this is refracted blue light, light from the sky coming down, being refracted through the air molecules just above the road, bending so much because of that difference in density that it ends up shining blue light up at our eyes. Okay, make sure you know this is refraction. All right, um, let's get some factual stuff in here. So we have um, what we call index of refraction. This is an, a formula that you're gonna need to be able to understand and we'll have a separate video where we just focus on the math um, that corresponds with this particular equation. But the idea here is that we can identify what type of materials we have um, based on how the light speed is affected. So I've been talking nonstop about how the speed changes because of the different materials. And so what we're doing in this particular equation is we are taking um, the velocity of light in a vacuum. So remember, a vacuum would be a space where there is no molecules. So there would be no density here, right? Essentially, we would have absolutely zero molecules in that area. So the speed at which the light is traveling would be the true speed of light. And in case you need a reminder, um, this would be a value of 3 or 3.0, however you want to write that, times 10 to the 8th power meters per second. So this top number C is always going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th. That number will never change in any of your calculations. So the V down in the denominator that is also a velocity. C is in meters per second, B is in meters per second. So sometimes students get confused as to um, 
Why is there two different speeds? Isn't it just three times 10 to the eighth all the time? Remember the idea here is that the speed of the wave is changing. So this particular velocity is not the velocity of C, the speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth. This is the actual physical velocity that the light experienced because of the medium it is passing through. So is it passing through glass? What is the speed now? Is it passing through water? Oh, here's a different speed. Is it passing through this other material? Here is the speed because of the density of that material. So this is a number that's going to change. If we take these two numbers, and we divide them together. So we put a ratio of how fast it should be compared to how fast it is because of the material, we end up with some decimal number. That decibel number is what we are going to refer to as the index of refraction. And that's what this equation is referred to as. This is the index of refraction formula. The letter N stands for the index of refraction. So in future questions, you'll hear us talk about the index. Um, that's going to be the letter N. This is going to be some number bigger than one because we're always going to have um, the actual speed of light larger than our denominator. So again, we'll have another video where we talk about the actual math of this um, later but for now the n value corresponds to the new speed and that is going to correspond to the density of the material which is going to be specific for the material so that being said when we look at um, illustrations like this I want you to recognize that we have light that has altered its speed so the light was traveling at this path it did not follow this path. Instead, what happened is once it hit the new material, the density of this new material caused that path to change. And so here is how the light ended up physically traveling. So we can identify what our um, materials are based off of knowing the speed that it should have been traveling to the speed that it is traveling through the material or we could flip it the other way around. If we know what our material is for medium one and medium two, and we know what their index values are, then we can use that information with this formula to figure out how fast the light traveled because we knew what those materials were, okay? So we have here just kind of some examples and statements I wanna make sure I go over with you. Um, when the light passes into a more dense material, then the light is going to travel slower. Now it says here, the smaller the angle, the slower the speed through the medium. So let's go back and let's look at this. When we are talking about measuring our angle, we should have already learned the normal line from previous lessons. And so the normal line is drawn for us here. In future illustrations, it's very likely not going to be drawn for you, so let's make sure we understand where that line belongs. This is always going to be a perpendicular line, um, and it's gonna be perpendicular to the boundary between our two materials. So in this case, air is on the top, water is on the bottom. So if we look at the normal line that I have drawn, it is indeed at a right angle or perpendicular to the boundary between the air and the water. So that means that all of our measurements are going to come from here. So if we look at how large the wave, I'm sorry, the um, angle is of the light coming from air into that boundary so we're going to measure from here to here this is going to be our angle and we're going to use theta this is a symbol that we've used in the past um, theta is going to be our angle so if we compare the angle at which the light was originally coming um, into our boundary and then the angle at which the light is traveling again measured from the normal line this angle is a much smaller angle than the original. So this tells me that the second material is more dense than the first material because a smaller angle is because the light is traveling slower through this particular medium. Here, <clears throat> we are looking at um, the index values, and this is kind of what I've already referenced um, just with the equation in general. The greater the index of refraction, the slower the speed of the wave through that medium. So when I look at um, the light, I know the picture has it going 
from glass into air, <clears throat> sorry, um, from glass into air. So it says here, the greater the index of refraction. So here is my original beam. Here is the altered path. Now we went into a more dense material because you see air has an n value of one, whereas glass has an n value of 1.5. Bigger n values, 1.5 is bigger, correspond with more dense materials. Glass is more dense than air. The light is going to travel slower in more dense materials. So by comparison, the light is traveling slower in glass and faster in air. Slower in glass because glass is more dense, faster in air because air is less dense. Okay, <clears throat> here we have what we call Snell's Law, and Snell's Law is um, a relationship that once again is allowing us to compare material one to material two. What we're gonna add in here is rather than just taking the one beam of light and comparing the speed to, of what it should be to what it is in just the one material, we're now gonna use both materials in our calculation. So when we are identifying um, the need for this equation, if we are given, here is air, and here's what I know about air, and here is water, and here's what I know about water, and so I now have values for both of my materials that are going to then be plugged into the formula. So if you notice, we have a subscript 1 and a subscript 2. So our first material is going to go on the left side. So this is medium number 1. So our first material. So if the light is going from air into water, air would be here. The second half of the equation, you see have the subscript of two, and so this is gonna be material or medium two. So if we're going from air into water, everything I know about water would go on the right-hand side because that would be material two. Now it's not always air and water, but this is a very common situation, so it's easy to just use it as my example. Um, this is sine the sine function. That is theta the angle. And again, I'll have a separate video to talk just about the math. So um, what I want to make sure that you get from this slide is um, we can identify the different types of materials based off the, their index values. You will need to reference this particular list in order to complete some of your practice work. But please understand that for quizzes and tests, you will not be asked to memorize this list. The information that you need will be provided in the problems themselves. It just so happens that for some of the practice work, um, not all the questions came with the values, so <clears throat> they are here for you to look back and reference so that you can have the information you need for um, your practice assignments. What I do need you to put in your notes and what you are going to be responsible for knowing is that the index for um, light passing through air is a number of one. Now let's just real briefly think back to the equation. C over V, where C is always three times 10 to the eighth. How can I get an N value of the number one? Well, the only way that I can do that is if I have three times 10 to the eighth as the numerator and the denominator. So what does that mean? That means that typically the density of air is so small that it actually does not have a measurable effect on the speed at which light travels. So if you look up right now in whatever room you're in, <clears throat> Or if you go outside and you just look up and you see light traveling to you, whether you're outside and it's light from the sun to your eyes or you're inside and it's light from the light bulb to your eyes, that light is actually coming to you at a speed of three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay, that's what it means to have an N value of one. So it says here, um, air slash vacuum. So if you have any questions about light traveling through air, 
the n value is 1. We will not spell that out for you in the word problem. You will just need to know that. If you have a question that talks about light traveling through a vacuum, the n value is 1, and you will be expected to know that. All right. Um, one last set of vocabulary here, the critical angle. Um, once again, there is a video that I have linked up to my website that you can watch, and I actually find it very helpful. So I would strongly recommend that you go and look at some of those additional videos that I have for you. But it says here that the critical angle is the angle at which light refracts at 90 degrees from the normal line. That is the critical angle. So what does that mean? That means that the light is going to bend, right? We have refraction. So here is an example of refraction like we've been seeing. So in this particular case, we have light that's originating from the water. It should follow this path, but instead the light is going to bend because of um, our change in material and it's actually going to follow this path, right? So this is what we've been looking at, but here it's telling us that it's going to refract at 90 degrees. So I want you to look very carefully at this. The boundary is the change in colors in this particular picture. So technically what the critical angle does is it is going to refract that light so that it is going to bend perfectly parallel with our boundary between our two mediums. So when we do a lab where we are shining light and watching it refract, we're gonna see that there's gonna be a point where the light is going to stop refracting through and it's gonna to seem to just disappear. Now, this is a very specific angle and so um, being able to shine the light perfectly so that you can recognize that this is happening is going to be quite challenging, but this is essentially what happens at the critical angle. So now let's keep reading. It says any angle beyond this point, any angle beyond this point will cause the light to become reflected rather than refracted. So let's look at this last image here. We now have light that is going into the boundary. And so here is my incident angle or my incident beam. Now, what's supposed to happen is the light is supposed to pass through and it's gonna come out over here at some funny angle, right? That's what we've been talking about. But since we have gone to an angle that is larger than whatever our angle was that created this 90 degree thing, now that we've gone past that, instead of the light passing through, it refracts so much that we don't even use the word refraction anymore. Now it refracts so much that it stays inside of that original medium. And so we just call that reflection. So the critical angle is the angle at which the light bends so that it's 90 degrees perfectly parallel with that boundary. It seemingly disappears because we can't see it. But then if we continue to increase that incident angle, it's going to refract so much that it actually just reflects and comes right back into that same material that the light originated from. So this is a special word that you're going to need to know in your lab. You're definitely going to be asked to find where is that point where it stopped refracting and it started reflecting. Um, and so that's what uh, the critical angle is going to be for us. So let's make sure we understand it's technically where the light refracts at 90 degrees, but what's easier for us to observe is anything beyond that point causes the light to then become reflected. So I want you to be familiar with both parts of that statement um, for quiz and test purposes. And then along the lines of this um, critical angle and being able to get the light to reflect instead of refract, um, here it says when the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, total internal reflection occurs. And that's what it was titled here in the picture as well, total internal reflection. So just a little fun fact for you, fiber optic cables use this idea of total internal reflection in order to send um, waves or energy through tubes. So basically they have um, the wave passing through the tube so that none of that energy is lost. It all just simply bounces um, 
at an angle so that it is all reflected inside of the tube. So we're able to send all of that energy down. Um, and it also is the fastest possible way for us to send energy. So um, that's just a little fun fact that I wanted to share with you.